All right, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, whatever it is. It is actually evening. We're going to talk uh, about Romans chapter 9. I'm not sure what part this is. I want to say it's part 8. We're going to pick up in Romans 9, verse 25 today, discuss uh, some of the prophetic texts that go back and are referenced here by Paul in Romans 9. <clears throat> so if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans 9. And we'll pick up in verse number 25, and we'll open in a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you for the time to study. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunities that we have every day to uh, discuss your word with others. And in your son's name we pray. Amen. Romans 9, verse number 25. Of course, the Apostle Paul has given you his uh, short dissertation here on the, the nation of Israel and where they uh, were, where they will be, and where they have been. And as a result, in verse number 25, he states uh, in verse 25, as he saith also in O.C., and he states, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. Now, the Apostle Paul, when he quotes prophecy, there's sometimes where people will say he takes a lot of liberty in quoting prophecy, and I think that is sometimes true. Uh, we have to look at the original text of this particular passage. O.C. is another name for Hosea. So if you have your scripture, turn to Hosea chapter number 2 as well. But he says, as he saith also in Hosi, Osi. So what he's telling you there is about uh, some, some blindness that takes place with the nation of Israel and the mercy that is being demonstrated to the Gentiles. But not only that, he's really more going to tell you about the remnant of the nation of, the, of Israel. So look what he says in verse 25 again. As he saith also in Osi, I will call them... My people, which were not my people. So in an understanding of who God's people are and who God's people would be, who are God's people? Well, today, you are the children of God. If what? You are the sons of God if you have the Spirit, are you not? Romans chapter number 8 makes that very clear, that we are the sons of God. And so now as a result of that, well, we now can't say that we've always been the sons of God. Is it true that we've always been sons of God? No. Who, has been the, who have been the sons of God? Well, those would be the children of Jacob, the children of Abraham, the children of the promise, right? And as a result, those children of the promise um, were uh, uh, um, a nation called Israel. So the, the promise was given to Abraham, of course, we know, confirmed to Isaac, confirmed again into Jacob, and then also to his 12 sons. And so when he says here in, in uh, chapter 9, verse 25, as he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, a lot of people just immediately say, well, that's about the Gentiles. That's talking about the Gentiles. Well, let me give you a couple passages. In one, let's look at Hosea. So Hosea... You'll go uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, chapter number 2, and, and read what he's quoting to. So, obviously, the, uh, the Apostle Paul, in his previous life before his conversion, was an individual who was very um, educated in the Jews' religion. Therefore, he studied the scriptures of the prophets quite a bit, but he never made the connections with the scriptures of the prophets until Christ revealed him that information, and that was that took place, uh, you know, multiple times throughout his revelation. Sorry about the dogs. I'll try to see if somebody else is coming if somebody wants to grab the door i know the youtube community loves the dogs they're always good for uh interrupting bible study if those blinds are open you can go ahead and shut them too and just bring the dogs over here so i appreciate it so in hosea chapter number two uh if you look with me please at verse number 23 and we're going to get context here in a second he states this and i will sow her unto me in the earth and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, thou art my people, and they shall say, thou art my God. See, now the question that becomes is, who is he talking about? Who is, what is the context there? Well, the context of this passage has nothing to do with the Gentiles. The context of this passage has to do with the adulterous whore, what we'd call the nation of Israel. And what we're going to look at today is, is the, the context is the whoring wife Israel. So if you go back to Hosea chapter number two, please, in verse number one, read what it says here. It says, say ye unto your brothers, Ami, and to your sisters, uh, Ruhama. And he says, uh, verse number two, and if you read the, I, I have the, the notes written in my scripture here, it says, the, the Ami means my people, and your, your sisters, it says, have obtained pity. And he says, plead with your mother, plead for her, she is not thy, my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight and her adulteries between her 
her breasts, lest I strip her naked, and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her as a wilderness, and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. Now, what is he talking about there? He's not talking about us like just one woman. He's making an analogy and comparing it to the nation of Israel, and it's it's the adulterous nation of Israel, and it's not that they're adulterous in a sexual manner, they're adulterous in a spiritual manner, because what they do is they whore after other gods. And they whore after them because they desire them. They lust after them. They're not satisfied with what they have in the promises of God. If you read in verse number four, it says, I will not have mercy upon who? Upon her children. For they be what? The children of whoredoms. So what is really what is really being discussed here? It's the nation of Israel and what they do in their, what we would call their folly. In their foolishness, they think that they uh, are missing something. They're missing out on something. So in turn, they look to the world to provide them with something. They say, we need that. We want that. Let's have it. It looks like they're having all the fun. To which God says, what are you talking about? I mean, what other nation can say you have a God so nigh unto, unto, unto you than, than you, Israel? Nobody else can say, look. Uh, God is, or is with us. God is protecting us. God is taking us all these nations for ourselves and all this land. Nobody can say that. What, what more do you need? I provide you food. I provide you clothing. I provide you raiment, shelter, and protection. What do you need? Well, what they need is the problem is that they were always, and we'll see today, they were looking at things from a fleshly carnal perspective to the extent that they could not see the end of it, which is what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And that end is obviously their need for redemption that occurs outside of them. And you may say, does that really come about through this text? It absolutely does, because he's going to hammer the end of chapter 9 with that issue of faith. So look again at verse number 4. He says this, And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms, for their mother hath played the harlot. She that conceived them hath done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water and my wool and my flax and my oil and my drink. And then he goes on and talks more about them. If you go back again just to uh, Hosea chapter number 1, you can get a kind of a little bit of idea about what's going on and why I believe that this scripture is definitely talking about the, the, the remnant of the nation of Israel. And when I mean remnant, I mean a small portion, a remnant, a, a, a portion of the whole. So not all of Israel is, is of Israel, and he's been discussing that in Romans chapter number 9, because if you go back, please, to Romans 9 verse number uh, 6, he says, Not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, Romans 9, 6, for they are not all Israel, which are of what? Of Israel. What does that mean? I thought if I was of Israel, then I'm Israel. Well, no, we broke that down and demonstrated that he, he goes back a little bit further. It's not just because you're the seed of Abraham that they, what, are the children, but what? In Isaac shall thy seed be called. And so we broke down who Ishmael was. Abraham went out and slept with his handmaid, Hagar, had Ishmael, right? And that was part of his will. That was part of what he decided to do in his flesh, in the work of his flesh, with, which brought about what? And we studied that out in, de in depth. It brought about a lot of calamity. We said that he's a wild man. He's going to be against all the nations. And yes, he did. He was, he was very much a, a, uh, uh, an opponent or an antagonist against uh, uh, Isaac. And so if you read again, he says, Neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they see be called. And then he says, That is. And I love that word. I use that, that phrase, that is, all the time because it's kind of a clarification. It says, That is, they which are the children of the flesh. What? These are not the children of God. But the children of the promise, and this is important today when we look at the promise, those are counted for the seed. And so let's go back to Hosea and let's read just a second about what he says here. So when you read any of the prophets, what, what are these prophets talking about? What is their goal? What is their purpose? How do you know that you can go back to a prophet and start reading it and understanding what it discusses and what it says? How do you know? How do you just go like, oh, just, let's open up Daniel. Let's open up Hosea. How do you know what it's talking about? Well, through Scripture, we understand uh, that, that Peter is one of the people that tells us a, a great deal about this in the book of Acts. He says in Acts chapter number uh, 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 3, go there if you would, in Acts 3, he says this, and it's, it's a really important text. Because, you know, you say, well, how do you know that that's what that's talking about? This could be talking about old times. It could be talking about something that already took place. How do we know it's a future event? How do we know it's prophecy? Well, in Acts chapter number three, if you read in verse number uh, 20, he says this, and he shall send, this is Peter talking to the nation of Israel. He says, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, 
So the Jesus Christ was preached unto the nation of Israel, and then he was received up into glory, and he was promised to return his second advent. And he says, he's going to come back, but it's not really a coming, it's ascending. And it has to uh, only come and take place at a certain time, and that certain time is what's stated in verse number 21. He says, whom the heaven must receive, that's where Jesus Christ currently sits, where? At the right hand of God the Father. Yes, does he not? Can he just say, hey, I want to come down right now. Can he come down? No. Why? What must take place? But I want to start my kingdom now. No, he can't. And you know how we know that's even more true? If you read the beginning of Acts, chapter number 1, in verse number 7, he states to them, to the apostles that are sitting there in Acts, he says, hey, you know, I know you guys want me to come back and establish this kingdom, but he says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put into his own power. So God, the Father, sends Jesus Christ back down to the earth. Sent. Not just he gets to come, he's sent. That's his whole ministry. His whole Jesus Christ earthly ministry, he was sent to do that. Uh, uh, Scott and I were just looking at some verses on Jesus Christ being sent and doing the will of God. He didn't come down to earth to do his will. Now look, let's look at that because I think that's important. Real quick. John chapter 8. John chapter number 8, verse number 26. John eight twenty six. He says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. There you go. He's sent from God. And what does he do? He says, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. So God the Father instructs Jesus Christ in what he says. Jesus Christ never says a single thing in his ministry that God the Father did not tell him to say. Really? Yes, because he was always obedient. Read what it says here in verse number 27. They understood not that he spake uh, to them of the Father. That means of God the Father. He says, Then said Jesus unto them, When ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. And that's demonstrated in the power of the resurrection, that you'll know that I am he. That means that I am Jesus and I am God, for nobody else can raise the dead but God. And verse, in the second part of verse 28, he says, And that I do nothing of myself. So when somebody tells you, I love Jesus Christ, but I hate God of the Old Testament. I mean, a lot of people hold that position. A Buddhist holds that position. If you, if you look at some of the Buddhists of the day, they'll say, oh, yeah, we love Jesus and the teachings of Jesus. Well, I don't think you do because those are the teachings of God. But they hate the Jehovah God, the violent, angry Jehovah God, the judge, as they would call him, right? But keep reading what he says, and he says, uh, verse 28, and, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. Verse 29, and he that sent me is with me, the Father hath not left me alone, for I do how often? Always those things that please him. If you turn back just one more page, you read in verse seven, chapter 7, verse 16, that what Jesus Christ does, he says, my doctrine or my teaching is not mine. So it's really a cool kind of passage to say, people who say, oh, I love Jesus. You need to be more like Jesus. Well, Jesus is God and God is Jesus. And we understand that obviously from, from John 1 and 1 John 5 and plenty of other passages that he discusses quite clearly that he is God. But he says, my doctrine is not mine, but his that what? That sent me. So now the sending is going to happen again. So he sent him the first time to do what? Jesus Christ was sent into the world to do what? Well, Paul says he was sent in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief, as Paul says. But he was also sent for a particular purpose. He was sent under, as, Acts 9, as Romans 9 states, to the nation of Israel. He says that Jesus Christ, to whom pertaining the flesh, Christ came. So with the nation of Israel, it came for them in the flesh. Read with me in verse number 21, and we'll see a little bit more about when he's going to be sent. Verse 20 says, and he, talking about God, shall send Jesus Christ. Just like he did the first time, he's going to send him the second time. Now this second time, if you just read this text, I'll tell you, there's no pre-tribulation rapture at all at this point in time in the scripture. It's not been revealed. It's not been discussed. It's not even been uh, uh, thought about in the mind of any man. But what is shown here is strictly a post-tribulation rapture. Well, how do we know that? Well, read what it says in verse number 21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times, and that's whenever you see the word times, this is Acts 3.21. Whenever you see times, you know that that's speaking of prophecy because prophecy works in days and years and months and times. And he says until the times of restitution. When you do harm and you hurt somebody, you need to make full restitution. And you do that full restitution by making them whole, right? 
you complete whatever. So for example, if you got into a really bad car accident and you broke the person's car and you also messed up their dog inside and you did a bunch of things and, and you, uh, they take you to court over the civil damages, they say, we need to make this person whole. What do you need to do to make the person whole? The judge orders you to pay restitution. And so restitution requires that you go and do, you know, whatever, X, Y, and Z, contact your insurance company and provide the payment necessary. If you don't have insurance, you're still liable. Pay them out of your wages. We'll garnish your wages. We'll take your money to make sure that that person's made whole, that they are, they are restituted. And so that's what he's saying here, that there's a restitution that has to take place. That means there's something that has to take full effect. And you know what that full effect is? That's God's word. God's word has to take full effect. It can't just be like, oh, that prophecy never happened. Oh, well, we'll just sweep that one underneath the rug. No worries. No big deal. That's not possible. Because what would that make God? That would make God a liar. That means he says things and they don't come to pass. Now, when Paul gives you further explanation about prophecy, and he says, this is what it looked like on its face value, and here's how it's actually going to work, that's not a contradiction. It's a further explanation as a result of revelation. But in here, he says the times of restitution of what? Of some of the things? No, of how many of the things need to take place? Of all things. Because if it's one thing that's left undone, what would take place? God would be a liar. Now, what's a case in point example of that? Can we think of one through the Bible, which is a case in point example in which God the Father was made completely 100% true in his words? Look at Luke 24, hold your place in Acts 3. In Luke chapter number 24, when Jesus Christ is walking with those disciples on the road to Emmaus, and they did not understand who he was, they were concerned that he had died and he was gone. In verse number 27, they state here, but we trusted that it had been he, meaning Jesus or the Christ, that had been uh, he which should have redeemed Israel. So the redemption of Israel was a part of what Christ's earthly ministry was to accomplish. They were going to redeem them, as it says in, in Luke 1 and Luke 2, from the hand of them that hate them, which would be who? Well, the nations of the world are against Israel. And if you read there, and he says, beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. So do these individuals believe in the resurrection of Christ? Well, no, because they didn't understand it. So as you keep going through here in verse number uh, 25, he, he talks about it and there's, you know, the, the, the sepulcher's gone. They don't believe it. And they say in verse number 25, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. How much did the prophets speak? All that the prophets have spoken. It can't just be a little bit. It's got to be all. So now, why are we talking about all this? I thought we were talking about Romans 9. Well, we are. But what we have to do is lay out a foundational issue that the prophetic element that we're going to discuss here in Hosea goes back to Romans chapter number 9 and correlates back to the end times. Basically, he talks about the, the uh, tribulation, the, the, the day of Jacob's trouble, the day of the Lord, and all of that stuff. So look at verse 26. He says, Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Now keep reading verse 27 and beginning at Moses and all the prophets he expounded, which means he explained, he further elaborated unto them in all the scriptures, not just some of the scriptures, he used all the scriptures, the things concerning what? Himself, which would be his death, right? which would be his burial, which would be his resurrection, his kingdom, his authority. And now turn to Acts chapter number three and we'll see why this is important. Because these times of restitution are the second part of the prophetic program. The first part is that Jesus Christ comes, he dies for the sins, and then what's the second part? Well, he comes back, and what's he doing in his, in his second coming? Well, he judges the world in righteousness and in truth, and he establishes a kingdom. Read what it says again here in verse 21. Whom the heaven must receive, where Jesus Christ currently sits, he's at the right hand of God the Father, he says, until the times of restitution of all things. Now, what are the all things? He's going to put a comma and he says, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Okay, so does that include Hosea? Yes. Is Hosea a prophet? Yes, he is. 
Is Joel a prophet? Yes. Is Amos a prophet? Yes. Obadiah? Yes. Jonah? Micah? Yes. So you start to realize, okay, well, these prophetic scriptures, they have a place, they have a role. They're sometimes hard to be understood. Well, yes, because to the lay person, to the, let's say, the unestablished in Christianity, they're kind of the last piece that you should be dealing with. Well, why do we say that? Well, Paul says in Romans chapter number 16, look at there with me real quick. Romans 16, Paul says the following. He tells you the order in which you should understand your scriptures, and in particular, he says, the scriptures of the prophets are the last piece he mentions. In Romans 16, verse number 25, the first issue that any individual needs to deal with before they want to have a right standing with God, before they want to be able to communicate with God, before God and them are reconciled, is the gospel. So Paul writes, Now to him, that's God, that is of power, to establish you according to my gospel. When a company opens, what is it called? Well, it's year of establishment, right? And so if you would like your year of establishment to be today or to, you know, you can do that by what? By what? The my gospel. You're established according to or by way of my gospel. Okay. It's not the gospel of the kingdom. He says in particular it's my gospel. A, a personal pronoun that is overlooked oh so often. A personal pronoun. My. He doesn't just call it the gospel. He calls it my gospel. Then he goes on to say, and Jesus Christ is going to establish you according to the preaching of Jesus Christ. But how is he going to do it? According to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Well, no. Why is that? Well, because you just read in Luke, did you not, that he, he expounded unto them all the things that the scriptures of the prophets had said about him. Okay, well, what does that not include? Doesn't include what's stated right here. According to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. And then you read the last part, and by the scriptures of the prophets. So the scriptures of the prophets are helpful, but they're the last step in your Christian life, the last part of your maturity. As Paul says, those things that are written aforetime are written for our learning. That's what he talks to you about in Romans chapter number 15. So go back with me to Acts, and let's ask a question. Well, okay, these prophets, they're there. Okay, I, I got it. Well, what's really... What, what do we do with those prophets? Well, read verse 22. He says, For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. This is a reference back to Deuteronomy 18, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. That's a reference to Christ's second coming, to his judgment. Deuteronomy 4.26 is a corollary passage. Now, verse 24 is very important. Read what it says. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after. So if you look in your Bible and you find Samuel, you got 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. You got, then you got a whole bunch of other major and minor prophets. All those prophets that have spoken... He says, as many as have spoken have likewise foretold of what? Of these days. Now, if you studied your scriptures out, I'll tell you, you'd be utterly confused. You'd sit there and go, none of that stuff took place. None of it happened. Why did it not occur? And most people would just say, well, oh, well, just have a little faith. We'll just move on. And then when you get confronted about a scripture that you really don't know what to do with, the option is to either A, say, I don't really care, B, to make it up as you go, or C, just say, just have a little bit more faith. I don't know, whatever you might want to say. So going back to these prophets that have spoken, they talk about the last days, and in particular, Romans 9 is addressing the short work that the Lord is going to make upon the earth. Now go back to, I'm quoting some of Romans 9, but go back to Hosea, please, and look at verse number uh, 1, chapter 1, verse 10. Prophets, as you see from Acts 3, they speak from the mouth of God, do they not? Does it not say in there that the prophets spoke by the mouth of God? They did. And so what the prophets say is God's word. 
And if you read here in verse number 10, it says, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea. Now, was that a promise made to Abraham? Yeah. He says, you're going to be as numbers as the sand of the sea. And what else does he say? And like the stars in the sky, innumerable. And then he writes there, which cannot be measured nor numbered. Oh, hey, that sounds kind of familiar. Is that stuff kind of coming back full circle? Sure, it does. And he writes, it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. Now note what it's stating here. Ye are not my people, there it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. So it's talking about the same group of people, is it not? Ye are not, ye are. Ye are not, ye are. Not saying, ye are the not my people, and then they are the sons of God. Is it saying that? No, it's saying ye and ye. Now, verse 11 sheds a little bit of light upon this. Verse 11 is demonstrating to you that the nation of Israel comprises itself of 12 nations, correct? Really, 12 different tribes, and they consider themselves to be separate nations, even though they really should be one nation. It says, then shall the children of Judah, there you go. Who is that? Judah is where the Judah is what Jesus Christ came from. He was the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's where David came from, right? And so the tribe of Judah is what? That's, that's the royal king tribe. And so if you read here, that's what David was. Uh, Joseph, I'm sorry, that's what David was. That's Joseph, uh, Jesus' adopted father. That's where he got that lineage from. So Jesus Christ got the tribe of Judah from who? From his father, Joseph, through adoption. And so what is that a picture of? What is that an example of? just how great adoption is, meaning you get to be adopted in God's family, how God saw it with David, because even though uh, Jesus was not of, the, of his father, meaning Joseph, he was born of the Holy Spirit, conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of a virgin, you still understand that God says that adoption has full force and effect, just like your adoption does through Jesus Christ. Little points that are made there, often overlooked, thought I'd mention it. Verse 11, then shall the children of Judah and the children of Israel. So you notice how he kind of puts Judah as a separate one? Because Judah, for the most part, they were the elevated tribe. I mean, they were the tribe that did things hmm, a little bit more obedient than a lot of the other tribes. But, of course, they still did a lot of horrible things, as you're going to read there. But he calls it the children of Israel, kind of making Judah separate. So if you, if you understand anything about the Israel and their history, the northern tribes comprised of the ten, and then the southern tribes comprised themselves of the two, which would be Judah and Benjamin. And so they, take, they took control of uh, Jerusalem and maintained the temple and that area there. And then they kind of considered everybody else to be outcast. And so we get that word Jew from Judah, right? And then we get Judea from the land of Judah, which then becomes the land of the Jews. Kind of see where the words come from? Makes a little bit more sense and kind of helps out. Uh, keep reading, he says, and appoint themselves one head, and they shall come up out of the land, for, for great shall be the day of Jezreel. Now keep reading what he's going into talking about. Verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. This is what we just started to get into. Say unto your brethren, Ami, which says, my people, and to your sisters, Ruhamah, plead with your mother. Plead, for, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Now who is this talking about? It's talking about God in Israel, Right? He's saying, look, I, I, Paul talks about, you know, the, 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 the church being espoused, you know, to one wife that he may present them to be, you know, uh, like, like a chaste virgin unto Christ. We've heard that phrase before. We understand what that means. And the chaste virgin is not a sexual thing. He's making it sexual to demonstrate something to you, the issue of purity. But he's more demonstrating to you how, how you see somebody who's unpure, right? If you know a woman of the night, if you know a harlot, you know, what is that connotation inside your mind? That lady's unclean, right? That lady's not clean. You want nothing to do with her, right? Kind of see how that works. Kind of like the woman at the well. She was a harlot, for lack of a better term. She was a whore. So now this here, when Paul's talking, or when Hosea is writing here and then Paul talks about it, he's, he's getting into discussing the spiritual aspect of it, which is what he always likes to do. And the reason why he does that is because it makes, it makes everything make so much more sense, that it demonstrates that God uh, has, has a plan and a purpose, which is effectuated through the free will of man. Now in verse number uh, four, read what he says, and I will not have mercy upon her children 
Who is the her? The nation of Israel is the her, for they be the children of whoredoms. So when Israel produced, produced these children, let's just go to the verse and it makes this really clear. Uh, go back to Deuteronomy chapter 24, okay? Deuteronomy chapter 24. This is a pretty deep, this is a deeper Bible study than maybe we usually go, but I hope it's helpful to you. Let me grab, um, that's a good one. Let me get you another verse too. Of course, I misplaced my other verse. I'm sorry. Go to Exodus 34 first, and then we'll go to Exodus 34. Then we'll go to Deuteronomy 24, which will discuss the uncleanness aspect. In Exodus 34, we're talking about the whoredom issue. We're talking about Israel making a, a whoring. So now when Israel is pulled out and taken from Egypt, Egypt is a land which is filled with idolatry, is it not? Yes. And so being filled with idolatry, it's very easy to go, well, we grew up in that. We really liked it. Let's go back to it. And so you saw that very quickly. They did that. Aaron did that. The high priest of the tribe of Levi goes out and goes after the, the whoredom of, of, of idolatry. And so read verse number 10 with me, 34, verse number 10, okay? And he said, behold, I make a covenant before all thy people, I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation and all the people among which uh, thou art shall see the work of the Lord for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Now, keep reading what it says. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorites. This is God offering protection. This is God doing what? Taking land that he promised Abraham. He says, oh, remember that land I promised you way back there? I'm going to take all of it and I'm going to give it to you. Why? Because that's my promise to you. But there is a contingency upon that, and that is the covenant of them obeying the law. And he says here, observe that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now look what he says here. Take heed. He's going to drive these people out of their land, but what's, what's going to create a problem? Well, when you're in there driving them out, you may have a desire to go, well, I like that Hizite, uh, that Hivite. I like that Jebusite. She's kind of cute. Or that guy's kind of pretty. I want to... I maybe want to marry him. Like he says, take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land. He's saying, when you start to do that, he says, it's not because they're just Jebusites or Hittites or Perizzites. It's because they're unbelievers and they're outside the nation of Israel. And I'm trying to teach you about cleanness. I'm trying to teach you about sanctification. And that's what Peter goes into in his diatribe in Acts chapter number 10. When he starts to see it, he goes, well, Jesus, I didn't, I didn't, and nothing, no unclean thing has ever entered into my mouth. What's he talking about? He's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about these Jebusites, these Hittites, these Perizzites, the Ethiopians, whoever they might be. He's like, well, I don't, I don't deal with any of that stuff. Well, keep reading what he says. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a, a snare in the midst of thee. So a snare is something that's hidden, is it not? You think, no big deal. I'll just, I'll just do it. And what ends up happening? It snares you. It's like the little bunnies when they're running through the woods. You set up a little bunny snare, and the snare is, is to be put between two sticks or two trees, and they look and see this, the plain path, but when in reality, the path has you know a snare on the other side of it. So they just see an opening, and that's what you always, when you, I guess nobody's ever thought about hunting bunnies before. You drive bunny rabbits. I guess this is my, uh, I don't know where I learned this information, somewhere at one point in time in my life. But you take bunny rabbits and when you try to catch them, you, you, you set up um, lots of, of, of barriers so that they see the opening. But in the opening, what appears to be an opening is actually a snare. You don't have to completely keep the uh, place you know, 100% covered, meaning your sides and the, and the walls, but there can be little, little openings, but they'll take the bigger opening. And that bigger opening is really the snare. So you drive them toward the snare. So he says, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. And these guys, I believe, would know how to hunt you know, rabbits because we don't really hunt rabbits. We go down to Winn-Dixie, the meat people. Isn't that Winn-Dixie? And we go buy meat. He says, but you shall destroy, this is what he wants you to do to them, but you shall destroy their altars. Why? Because they're not altars of the Most High God. They're not altars to Jehovah God. They're altars to who? False gods. And he says, and break their images and cut down their groves. 
For thou shalt not, thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Pretty straightforward. Don't go make a covenant. Don't get into a marriage relationship. Don't say, hey, we'll offer you protection because what ends up happening? They'll infiltrate and then they'll infect. Verse 15, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go what? They go a whoring after their gods and do sacrifice unto their gods and one call thee and thou eat of his sacrifice. And thou take of their daughters and unto thy sons and their daughters. And what ends up happening? And you go a whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a whoring after their gods. And what do you end up becoming? Boy, I'm of Abraham and I'm of Isaac and I'm of Jacob. No, you're not. How? What way? We're discussing this in a spiritual sense, not a fleshly issue. So look with me at, at uh, uh, Deuteronomy, please, 24. What is the option for one who has committed adultery? Well, under the law, the option was divorcement, was it not? And look what he talks about in terms of the divorcement. <clears throat> when a man hath taken a wife, 24 verse 1, and married her, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he what? Hath found some uncleanness in her. What does that mean? That, that he has found that she has been defiled by somebody else, meaning that she's slept with somebody else. What ends up happening? He says, then let him write her a bill of divorcement. Now, when you write the bill of divorcement, what does that do? That separates the tie. You're no longer part of the family, are you? Nope. You're out. You're done. When you get divorced, the uh, inheritance laws completely change. So you could inherit until you get divorced. There's been a lot of times where the divorce isn't finalized. The husband hates the wife. The husband doesn't have a will. And as a result, passes by intestacy and inheritance law. And the wife gets everything. But the family all comes in and says, no, he would have never wanted that. But underneath the eyes of the law, they're still married. And as a result, she gets to take his inheritance. So what we see here through this is that God uses these examples, God uses this issue of, hey, this whoring after another God, this concept of an adulterer, which we understand and see and understand what uncleanness is, to demonstrate what it's like in a spiritual sense when Israel does things that they're not supposed to do, when they go whoring after other gods. Read with me in, uh, in Judges, please. Judges chapter number 2, verse number 16. I, I could. I'd love to just go through here and talk all about what happens, but if you, um, let's start in verse number twelve of Judges two, verse eleven. <laughs> I would love to keep going, but let's just stop there. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served who? Served Balaam. Okay, what is that? That's a false god. Did they serve Jehovah God? No, they served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods, of the gods of the people that were round about them. Hmm, does that sound familiar with what we just studied there in Exodus chapter 34? Yeah. God says, hey, don't go do this. Israel says, no, no, we know better. We'll be okay. They're pretty people. We like them. We want to take them for wives. We want to make covenants with them. He says, well, you do that, you'll go whoring after them. That's what happens. And they followed other gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them. And what did you do? You made God angry. You provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtaroth. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel. And he delivered them in the hands of the spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could, no, they, they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Whithersoever they went out of the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said and as the Lord had sworn unto them, what? And they were greatly distressed. See, God had an oath with them. And he says, when you mess up, you get to pay the punishment. You get to pay the price. And so well, this is a demonstration for us. We look back and we go, wow, we're so glad we don't live underneath that law. We're so glad we don't have to live underneath that condemnation of constantly having to face distress and perils because why? We're saved by grace. Look what he writes in verse 16. Nevertheless, the Lord raised up judges. And so the judges were to deliver them out of the hand. The judges came and said, hey, folks, Israel, listen up here. You guys have done evil again. Now, did God just say, I'm going to kill all of you? No, he loves his people. He always has, always will. And the reason why you can understand why the nation of Israel has not been forsaken by God is demonstrated throughout all of these passages. 
what was the pushing point for God, right? It should have been to the death of his son, right? I mean, if God still didn't, if God still accepted him after the death of his son, what other thing could you do to God to anger him to the extent that he would cut you off? Well, that's why Romans 9, 10, 11 is so important in your understanding of who Israel is. Verse 17, it says, And yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. So you can kind of see that it's, it's, it's so important that you realize what happens when Israel disobeys is judgment upon them. And the judgment that they experience today is fully evident. Does the nation of Israel possess all the lamb uh, uh, promised to them? No. Is all the nation of Israel gathered together? Uh, no. Are they completely scattered? Yes. And why is that? Because of their disbelief. Because of the whoring that they did. Go back to Romans 9. And I want to compare some of this for a second. Read 9 again, verse number 25. And he says, As he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. So now the question is, people say, well, no, see, the nation of Israel was the beloved. and the Well, hold on. Read what it says back in Hosea, okay? What is Hosea talking about? Hosea is saying the nation of Israel, God says, you're not my people. But hold on, we are your people. But remember, we read back to Romans chapter number 9, verse number 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, Right? So in the eyes, they say, these are not my people. Now what is he going to say? They are my people. Look what he reads in verse number 26. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people. Notice that it's talking about the same group of people. When were the Gentiles ever not called my people in the sense that he's talking about here, right? Where he says, look, and he saith also, says, I will call them my people, which were not my people. Hosea discusses evidently clear that that is talking about Israel. Is anybody in, un, not miss, missing that point or not seeing that? Verse 26, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, that's Israel, you're not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Now go back again to Hosea and read what it says here. Hosea 2, verse number 23. I will sow her unto me in the earth, Israel, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. Why did he not obtain mercy? Because they weren't deserving of mercy, because what they did was evil. And he says, and I will say unto them which were not my people, and that's discussing here in, in, in Hosea 2, verse number 4, I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. They're saying, you're not, you're not my people, you're children of whores, just like he says in Romans chapter number 9, you're children of the flesh. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Now look what it says here. Then said the Lord God unto Lord unto me, Go yet, go yet, love woman beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress, according to love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So I brought her to me for fifteen pieces of silver, and for a homer of a barley, and for a half homer of barley, and I said unto her, Thou shalt abide for me many days. Thou shalt not play the harlot. Who's playing the harlot? Israel's playing the harlot. Israel's being a whore. What are they doing? They're going after other gods. And he says, And thou shalt not be for another man, so will I also be for thee. For the children of Israel shall abide many days without a king, and without a prince, and without a sacrifice, and without an image, and without an ephod, and without a teraphim. Is that happening today? Yes. And he says, Afterward shall the children of Israel return, and seek the Lord their God, and David their king, and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the what? Latter days. Do you think that that's just talking about one little point back here in Hosea? Uh, no. It's not just talking people, oh, let's just talk about way back there in B.C. 785 when Hosea was... No. Because what you don't see is what is discussed in Acts 3. Let's read the passage again in Acts 3. Acts 3. Verse number 24, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of what? Of these days. What days do you think he's talking about? Well, let's ask Peter. He just tells you about it in Acts chapter number 2, verse number 16. Look what he writes here in 2 verse 16. 
This is about what takes place at Pentecost, the, the Holy Spirit coming down and the, uh, all the apostles speaking in tongues. We know it's the apostles because they were all from Galilee. Verse 16, it says, But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Hey, isn't that what we just said? As many of us have spoken with Samuel. Is Joel after Samuel? Yep. Did he talk about the, 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 these days? Yep. What are these days? Verse 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days. Now let's go back to Hosea chapter number 2, verse number 3, verse number 5. Afterward shall the children of Israel return and seek the Lord their God and David their king and shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Now, does that have um, does that have importance in a historical sense? Yes. But does it also have more importance in a prophetic sense? Yes. Go with me, if you would, go back to Romans 9. Verse number 27. Now, I want to explain to you how we know that what is discussed in 25 is talking about Israel, okay? Verse 25, he says, As he saith also in Osi, and then, which is talking about Hosea, then in verse 27, Isaiah, or Isaiah, also, what, crieth concerning Israel? Well, 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 hold on, hold on. Why would we need to use the word also? If nobody's cried against, or nobody's talked about it yet, because also is telling you that Hosea was talking about Israel. You see how important it is to pay attention to the words that are there? Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel. Well, who cried before him? Hosea. And then who cried? Isaiah cried. Now look what he cries about. Now tell me if this isn't what we just read in Hosea chapter number 1. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea. Did we read that in Hosea 1? Yes. Was that a promise made to Abraham? Yes. Did that come through Ishmael? No. Who did that come through? Isaac. He says, though the children of the Israel be as the sand of the sea, a what? A remnant shall be saved. Look at, uh, look at Isaiah, please, chapter number 50. We'll close with these couple verses. Isaiah 50, and just read this verse. Thus saith the Lord, where is the bill of your mother's divorcement whom I have put away? Who is he talking about? Who is their mother? Doesn't Paul talk about Israel? The mother of us all, right? Doesn't he say that in Galatians? Remember that passage? See, what, what's, what's got to be really clear in this is that these, this remnant that occurs, right? This is really going to be important really during the tribulation period of time. During right now, today, there is a remnant that, of the nation of Israel that's saved, right? There's a remnant according to the election of grace, right? You can read that in Romans 11. We'll eventually get there. Meaning that, was everybody in Israel believing today? No, of course not. Do you know plenty of Jews who do not believe the gospel of the grace of God? Yes. Do you know plenty of Jews who deny who Jesus Christ is? Yes. And the reason why they do that is, do they, do they not believe that... They do not believe in God? No, they believe in God. They believe Jehovah? Yes. They believe in the Torah and the, and the Pentateuch? Yeah, and it's not? Yeah, of course. But what do they not believe? They don't understand the further progressive revelation of God to help explain all of those things, and thus they sit there incredibly lost trying to understand what the Bible says or what their, what their Pentateuch really says. So instead of understanding that, they, that it's for a condemnation, it's for death, they look at it as being for life, to which... One time I was talking with one of my uh, guys who's Jewish, and <laughs> what did he say? He, he says, uh, oh, I got to make it over, because um, you got your, you know, your, your, your Rosh Hashanah, right? Which is like your high holiday. That's like your main, your main I'm not sure about all the words, but I believe that's called, it's Rosh Hashanah. It's your main high holiday. And that's like, that's the, that's the time in which the synagogue will have full attendance, complete full attendance. Every week they have services. Won't be many services. Why? Because those services don't really matter. But when you have your high holiday, when you have your quote-unquote Passover, why, why is that so important? Because that is when they're going, really they call it the Day of Atonement, that's when they're going to get their forgiveness. 
and it's really funny because we were joking and uh, one of the partners of this firm is Jewish and the other partner is Christian and there he says, you know, oh, uh, yeah, Jimmy calls me, Jimmy, you got to go to Rosh Hashanah, don't you? You know, get your forgiveness. <laughs> and he's like, he's like, yeah, he goes, you know, you can get that all through the, you can get that all through Jesus right now or something like that. Kind of like, okay, yeah, you know, but it's pretty funny how he looks at it and he sees it. Yeah, I can get all that through Jesus now, but you can just go back. I'd love to just spend hours talking about those pieces as well. But either way, this, this issue of, of the flesh, this issue of the outside, this issue of the people, this issue of the remnant that we're going to see, their salvation, we're going to see that, that their, the tribulation period that is experienced is called the time of Jacob's trouble. And it's called the time of Jacob's trouble in particular because it's a wrath that God puts upon not only Jacob and, and it's particularly his trouble, meaning the nation, of it's obviously not Jacob, he's dead. Right? So it's not Jacob's trouble, meaning he doesn't exist. He's him and he exists. He's in heaven, but you know what I mean. It's, it's Jacob's uh, children, Israel, and Jacob is named was Israel. So uh, if you look, uh, just let's do, let's do one more passage, and I'll, I'll show you how this is going to work. Um, look, at, look at Zechariah. Joel, Amos, Habakkuk, Zechariah. And let's just read through uh, verse number 8, and we'll read through the sum of 14, and we'll close. Zechariah 13, verse number 8. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die, but the third shall be left therein. So what is that in relation to? Well, that's what ends up happening with the judgment upon the nation of Israel, and most of them die through the tribulation. They don't, and they don't make it through it. They can't, they can't survive through it. Verse number nine, and I will bring the third part through the what? Through the fire. Doesn't Jesus Christ say in Matthew chapter number three that there is a baptism with fire? That's what this is. He's going to bring them through the fire. And what happens when you make it through that tribulation? right? You're refined, aren't you? He says, you'll refine them as silver is refined, and I will try them as gold is tried. They shall call in my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. Wow, doesn't that just ring right a bell with what we just read there in, in Romans chapter number 9? Absolutely. And it doesn't correlate back perfectly with, with Hosea. It does. All this stuff has connections. Now look what he says. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. And thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee, for I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the house is rifled, and the woman ravished, and the half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. This is not what took place in AD 70 at the fall of, Israel, of Jerusalem. It didn't take place. God did not fight against those nations. They were destroyed. Now, what happens at the end of all of this is that Jesus Christ returns, meaning that he is sent back by God at the restitution, and that's why you read in verse number four, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives. That's Jesus Christ. His feet stand on the Mount of Olives. He's there. He physically is there. So people say, well, there's no kingdom. It doesn't exist. It's not true. He says, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half it toward the south, and you shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azale. Yea, you shall flee like as you fled from before the earthquakes in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one that day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night but it shall come to pass at evening time it shall be light and then you read in verse number eight and it shall be in that day that the living water shall go out from jerusalem half of them toward the former sea and half of them toward the hinder sea and in the summer and the winter shall it be and the lord shall be king over what over all the earth and at that day shall there be one lord in his name one so there's a lot to unpack on that we'll stop with that piece but that's going to give you a taste of what's going to come and we're going to look at how the gentiles in romans chapter 9 how they obtain what israel was supposed to obtain and the reason why they obtained it is because they listened to what God said about the promise. And they took it by promise and by faith and not by works. And they didn't stumble at the stumbling stone, that rock of offense, which is Christ. All right, let's close.